a new film out. Okay, hello, hello. Oh, we've got Laura Matthews. That looks like Ricky Proto has joined the call. We will stop the video and... <laughs> All right. So, hello, good morning, uh, and welcome to um, another SDS webinar brought to you today by us and some of our key clients. Uh, well, Mark is in the client, but he's here anyway, and we thank him for that. Uh, so today, uh, we're going to... We've also got a lot to talk to you about with regards to net energy zero, the pressures it's putting on housing associations. It, it is a big topic right now. And uh, Marcus is bringing, us, is bringing us some solutions, some very productive solutions that are imaginative. And uh, Phil is going to then start talking about Proval and how Proval will, how we're trying to develop the product to support you in carbon emission modeling. Uh, but just as we let people filter in, uh, we had a Queen's speech just recently, and I'm just going to sort of go to, to, to Duncan and Andrew for some initial reaction for that. So, Duncan, would you like to just kick us off quickly on, on your initial reaction from the Queen's speech and what that means? I'll try and keep calm about it, Chris. Yeah, um, yeah uh, I've got to be fair. Um, my main um, area is obviously the watered down or fundamentally any good bits removed. Uh, planning reform bill that's not called that anymore. Um, uh, I have a few concerns, as you might imagine, by um, obviously giving lots of people more influence over planning decisions and the zoning bits being removed, I think, is of a concern. Of a greater concern, Chris, would be the removal of Section 106 delivery, which, in my humble opinion, and certainly in my lifetime, is the most successful affordable housing delivery mechanism in this country um, and my concern with the arrangements for a wider or enhanced community infrastructure levy or whatever it gets called is that it will be a slowing down of affordable housing delivery in most local authority areas if local authorities are asked to administer and deliver the housing as a consequence of it uh, they will struggle to do so and they will struggle to do so quickly no disrespect to any of um council colleagues on the call and um i'm extremely disappointed by it um, and would do anything in my power to lobby against it i think is is my starting point andrew i don't know whether you want to augment or tell me i'm a nutcase as a consequence <laughs> good morning if you're just joining us we've got we've got some initial reaction to the queen's speech while everyone filters in uh, andrew go ahead I, I just think good morning, Lydia. It's, and it's, it's, it's quite an interesting um, point that uh, Duncan has raised there. So I, I think that there needed to, to be something um, and, and change the kind of outbidding or bidding up schemes that's been happening. I think uh, I've been involved in some kind of local authorities' bids for Section 106, and it seems um, that the power of the local authority with their assumptions against RPs only pushes the price up. I'm not suggesting that this will be a better way or, or, or replace the numbers through Section 106. That will be interesting to see. Um, and as you rightly say, some local authorities are, are well down the track of having a robust and good development programme. Some are wholly not. Some are doing it differently because they haven't had stock. So they're, they're partnering with RPs anyway. So the whole process of how that would kind of filter down and actually stop and still continue supply on the transfer will be interesting um and 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 this the seal payment has has put a marker on lots of um development anyway um because it's horrendous costs you know and and seeing where those costs are being spent i think will be um from a private perspective you know, when you when you bid for land and, and do development and whatever, where that money is actually going and being spent is 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 of an interest as well, um, because I don't see much happening on, on the infrastructure side of things. Okay, so uh, I, I'm not. I, I just attended the the Brighton CI. I just come back from that, and it, it was such a it was a great conference, and everyone was in really high spirits. Uh, and yeah, I don't think. Well, I don't yeah, know. In Brighton. Yeah, well, I, well, Brighton is actually very rainy and windy, and <laughs> that's it's probably helped. Than in Barcelona, um, <laughs> I, I think that the, no one I've spoken to is convinced that any of the leveling up, uh, the leveling leveling up plan is is going to do anything. Uh, 
to support you know affordable housing if anything it's actually crippled it uh, so uh, there, there were some pretty strong opinions there um, but it's now ten of five so let us uh, go on to our first speaker Marcus Blaney who is involved in a lot of imaginative solutions that Wales and West are taking and uh, over to you Marcus Hi, good morning all. Can you, can you see my screen? Yes. What's up? Great. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm coming from less cloudy skies across the bridge in Wales. Uh, we've got a much sunnier outlook, I think, than um, some of the doom and gloom that we have I've viewed this morning already. So, um, yeah, what I've been asked to do is talk about Wales and West's approach to the zero carbon agenda and, you know, um, but how we really bring our residents to the forefront of our decision making, thinking about what's right for them. Um, and in the big, the, how much I reckon the juggling act with the costs and everything else that we have to um, kind of deliver for for meeting Welsh government perspectives, all that kind of thing. So I'll jump into it and um, just give you a bit of an oversight about who Wales and West are, because a lot of you will, will not know or may not be aware of us. We're a leading provider of affordable housing in Wales for over the last fifty years. We operate through th three regions of Wales, through from our North Wales offices our South Wales offices and our West Wales offices, and we employ over 680 employees uh, in the wider group. So the Wales and West housing group is made up of, of Wales and West housing. We've got Cambria, who are our maintenance arm, and we've got Casteth Catering and Care, which do our catering and care components uh, in, 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 those, in those schemes. We've got 12, over 12,000 homes around 15 local authorities. We know we're very proud to say that we're a three-star best companies and the best not-for-profit organisation in Wales. And we've got platinum status for investors and people, which, again, we're very proud of as an organisation. So the Wales and West vision um, is to achieve strong, sustainable growth and making a difference to people's homes, lives and communities. And that really is the focus of everything we do in Wales and West. And it is at the, you know, it's at the forefront of what we do, especially as a development team. Um, at the, in the development team, it, 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 that, that, that kind of vision is um, embedded into our culture, or we try to embed it into our culture. We, we certainly, in Wales and West, we don't build just for the sake of building. We make sure that we are building um, the right home in the right location. Um, we, we're not concerned with numbers. We, it is about, again, building the right home in the right location and for the right purpose and for the right, out, for the right reasons. And then we, we also, we, we're trying to embed a culture of continuous learning and improvements not just in development, but across our, um, across our departments and improving that communication between departments as well is really key to us. So our development approach, um, and we, we kind of look at these kind of as, as the four key principles in our approach to development. We know with, with having our residents at the forefront of, of our decision-making, we, we want our homes to be affordable and comfortable for them to live in. That, that's really important for us. We've, they've got to be buildable, easy to build, easy to construct, and we've put mechanisms in place to try and help us with that. And again, as we've got our own maintenance arm, maintenance is really important to us. We know we, 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 if we're doing it in-house, we've got to get that right. So when we're building, we're thinking about what we're putting in the components that are easy to replace, easy to repair, easy to maintain. And then the, the, the new part of this is, is about getting to near zero carbon. And I, we, 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 and Claire, careful in saying the word near, not, not making a commitment to, to zero carbon because as, as, as an organisation, we, we're not very target driven. We, we, we do what, again, we, it sounds really cheesy, but we do what's best. We, do, we don't do something just to meet a target. So, you know, is, is net zero the right thing for, for um, zero carbon, the right thing for our residents? P possibly, but we will not make that commitment yet. We, will, we know getting close to zero carbon is the right thing to do. So that's where we're heading. So what we, what, what I said, we talked about a lot about our residents and they are, you know, they, they are the, the, the key decision maker when we're building new home, homes. But there's lots of other factors that we have to take into account. It's what the local authorities want from us in terms of legislation, what planning requirements there are, the SUDS legislation that we now have to deal with, which is it's caused us enormous delays in our process. Welsh government requirements in terms of funding, targets to meet EPCA and, play, and the placemaking agenda. We got, you know, we got the, the our internal departments thinking about them being easy to build, easy to maintain, and you know, with our residents cheap to live in, you know, especially with the poverty crisis we've got at the moment, energy bills going up, we've got to ensure that what we're building um, is um, is suitable and, and cheap to, for our residents to live in. The one there I've got as a, as, as a, um, a client as well, which it sounds a bit odd, is the environment. 
but we know we've, we've got to be a you know, responsible organization. We've got to think about global warming, biodiversity, landscape amenity, and that's where we're going towards the kind of zero carbon agenda. So what I said, like I said earlier, we, we as Wales and West, we've to, we'd like to set our own objectives when specifying design in our own homes. You know, we're there to challenge some of those um, requirements from Welsh Government around EPCA. You know, there, a, lot of, a lot of people will, will be aware kind of EPCA is a kind of tick box exercise in our eyes. You know, there are, we think there's better mechanisms to measure what's right for our residents, what's the best affordable um, source of heating. You know, we, we know that getting the right first time in terms of the, the, the building fabric. So, you know, those kind of things are where we're doing a lot of research design and stuff at the moment. Um, we, we, we're learning from, we know, we, we know it's, it's lots of new technologies out there. We're learning from them. We're, we're experimenting and um, there's, lo there's lots of schemes that we, that we have delivered where it's probably a little bit new, new at the moment to, to understand if it's, if it's the right thing to do. But we're putting lots of monitoring information in, what monitoring equipment in, so that we're we're seeing the impact that, that some of these developments are having. So, what one what is the de development that we're looking at at the moment? This is a bit of a case study um, where we have just got planning permission for uh, an over 55s complex, which is actually on the same piece of land as our new offices, which are going to be um, being built in West Wales in Cardigan. So it's a site of a former hospital, and um, it was a very sensitive site in terms of um, locals. It's you know every, everyone had a story about the local hospital. The local hospital had closed, fallen into disrepair, but there was you know there was there was an original building on there designed by John Nash, which was important to the residents. So we 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 we, did, we took an awful lot of consultation with the community to understand what was important to them, and and we listened to that community. They told us that hospital had lots of memories. We, it, we, we realized it was a, around that old original John Nash building. So we, we've the, in the design solution, we've kept that building, even though it's going to be a challenge to us in terms of ret, kind of retrofitting an, that old building. But because our offices are on that site, you know, it was, it was a per, perfect place to try and um, build our offices around and you know, utilize another part of the land for our for our um, for our residential aspect for over 55s. We we, when 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 we design any schemes, we're looking at how we. Well, we there's a requirement now from our government to think about placemaking and meeting placemaking objectives. The, the the process in in Wales at the moment is that Welsh government scrutinise every scheme that goes forward for funding, so they want to see the schemes at, at concept stage, where very initial um, concept plans drawings go into Welsh government for approval, and then they, they, we we develop them up once they've been uh, approved, and we go back again before planning. To see how things have changed, moved on, and then they approve planning drawings before um, before uh, before they go into planning as well. They, they don't see it again then until the building's complete, and then they undertake a review of that process to, to make sure it's in line with what what they approved at that early stage. So there's there's lots of these requirements that we're, we're having to fit. But in in the main, we we we, know, we agree with the approach that Wales government is setting, Welsh government is setting. Um, but it's sometimes we're there to challenge some of those, you know, the, those key targets that that Wales, that Welsh government are setting, and making sure that what we're doing is right for our residents. So, um, you know, like I said earlier, the, the design response to this has been very much around um, the community and from what we understand from um, our existing residents and other schemes, and from our internal teams. We're building in line with the happy principles, which people might be familiar with for older people. Um, think looking about how we um, tackle issues of isolation and loneliness um, and thinking about the cost to run for, 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 for um, the residents. So in, in those photographs at the bottom, you'll see the kind of design solutions where trying to put build, it, it, it's a very much a gateway site for the town of Cardigan. It's the first site you see as you um, enter the town centre. So we wanted to leave a kind of a, 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 a state, make a bit of a statement on that site. Um, we, we know the, 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 you've got inclusion of arches and things like that for soft softening of landscaping. It's certainly not the cheapest way to build, but we think it's the right approach. It's around the central courtyard area where our residents can meet and interact. But that is courtyard area also links to the church next door. So we're improving um, links to the community with the church and building in a community cafe into that John Nash building so that we're build, building our integration into the community as well and also for, for, for our residents. The way we're designing that building is you can see in the artist's impression there as well. 
what what is important to us is trying to get that kind of dual aspect on properties from a um, a, a carbon point point of view to get ventilation into homes, but also from um, you know an, an outlook and amenity aspect for residents. So we're building these kind of walkway external walkway areas. We know we know it, they haven't been successful in history. So how do you, how do you do them better? There we we're almost like the outside spaces, but indoors, so we can get louver doors in there, so they've got balconies, meeting um, private spaces outside the doors for integration with residents. But also though that that those walkways overlook the courtyard area, so that people can meet, chat over the balconies and. We know that is important to our residents. That's hope, hopefully better than just walking into a flat through a, a dark corridor into your flat and um, yeah, not, not, not integrating with the rest of the world. So this is a scheme that we're looking at. We're, 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 it's, it's on site. It's starting to be developed. And hopefully we'll, we'll learn a lot of lessons from, from this. Um, the, the, the zero carbon agenda, you know, we, we are very much looking at a fabric first approach, really minimizing what we're doing with m and &E. If we get the fabric right, we shouldn't need to worry too much about heating. Yes, we need to think about what the 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 the, the water heating, uh, how we heat our hot water. We're doing a lot of research about what's the most effective way of doing that. About putting in PV, we know we want we, we want to put PV on, on on all our buildings and all our flats. But how do you best utilize that PV? You know, where's the energy going? Is it going um, straight to the straight to the resident? Is it going to communal areas? How does that get um, distributed evenly and fairly around? around the residents. Um, so there's all these challenges that we're, we're exploring in, in, in the in detailed design. Um, and we, we, I'm sure we will learn lots of lessons as we go forward with this one. So another thing that we look at is, is, is building in the right location. Um, we, we've got a strategy about, you know, we'll go back to our vision about strong, sustainable growth. We, we, we Welsh Government have recently kind of relaxed rules around zoning in local authorities. Most of our cells were zoned for particular regions. That has been relaxed recently. We, you know, we could open up to everywhere. We, we, we operate in most of the local authorities in Wales, but for us just to open the floodgates to go everywhere probably isn't the right approach. We need to think about um, building around where we are established, where we've got our links for property services, our maintenance arms, and slowly grow and grow in the right places around, around that. But um, having said, we're, lo we're looking at options around mixed tenure going forward. As, as an organisation, we, we're very we're very firm in the direction. Our, our core business is around social rented units. That that is what we want to do and what we want to do the most of. Um, but we have got um, ambitious. Um, I, won't, I won't use the word targets, but um, a goal of building around five hundred homes a year. And we know to do that, even with you know when when grant funding is is you know widely available at the moment for us. But to do that, we know to do that constantly over a number of years. We're going to have to look at mixed tenure developments. And we will take the same thought process through our, the building of market sales, um, social rented, and we've developed our own kind of affordable home ownership product called Own Home Cymru. And we, we're, we're developing sites with this in mind at the moment. It's effectively like a low cost home ownership at 70% of the market value, but we've got lenders to, to buy into us um, that 30% that, that equity would, would, be the, would be the residence deposit. We understand that you know that a big a big challenge for people uh, getting on housing ladder is is the ability to raise a deposit to buy, buy the house. That thirty percent that we're putting in, um, actually the, the lenders are happy that that would be the the the, the owner's um, deposit. So it's something which um, we we've got the uh, kind of a game okay in principle, and we're developing schemes up. We haven't seen it in in reality yet, but we, we won't be far off building schemes uh, in in this kind of a third a third a third manner. Um, across across Wales, it, it would be easier in some locations in Wales where where land is 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 more affordable. So you can see, I can see we'll we'll do more of this maybe in, in West Wales and maybe in North Wales, in in kind of in these rural suburbs where people find it hard to get on a ladder, especially in the post COVID environment where there's lots of pressures from um, you know in, in, in inward migration into West Wales, and you know local people are finding it hard to get on the housing ladder. And this 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 product will really help people get on the ladder uh, in in these areas. Thank you. Um, You've got just one minute left, just later. Okay, great. So um, what I said, I I again earlier I said about creating a culture of learning and improvement. Again, we're going back to talk to our residents all the time about what matters to them, what's important, um, and um, 
engagement with our, our property services team about how we maintain these products, all these things going forward. Um, we've got we've got lots of other innovative ideas. We've set up ten year relationships with our contractors and EA partners, so that it's you know they they've got designated work. They're buying in to to what we're doing early in the process. That able to input into the feasibility stage, into the planning stage. So we've got our contractors working with us for the next 10 years, inputting all their thoughts, ideas at the earliest stage. And I just wanted quickly to say about some key challenges that I know all of you will be aware of with all this, but understanding what's important to our residents, keeping that communication um, going with them constantly, um, education for residents around some of these ideas and thoughts. So these new technologies are going into properties. We've got to educate residents on how we use them. Um, the speed and change of new technologies. Once we're once we're you know we're, we're designing these um, schemes with these technologies in, it's taking so long for them you know to see the fruits of them. You know, four or five years down the line, by the time we've thought about what we're doing, to the scene and delivered on site. Obviously, you're meeting the balance between um, our aims and objectives and the cost of delivery. So you know these things cost a lot, an awful lot of money. But we 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 we, we make the decision that that is what is right for our residents, and that is the most important things. But it is still it's still got to be affordable to deliver, um, and we you know keeping on evaluating and learning from what we're doing and with the right purpose in mind is really important to Wales and West Hives. So thank you very much for your time. Sorry I overran a little bit there. Thank you so much, Marcus. Really appreciate that, and you know hopefully that's inspired some of you uh, to look at your development programs and you know understand you know what what can we really do when we ask the tenants first and want to work with them. And certainly the way you, you were talking about using local materials, Marcus, was you know in, in today's age when we're looking at rising building costs, uh, this is the sort of strategies that uh, you know will will help us. Um, so we're now going to. We're, we've been developing, we're looking at our ProVal development roadmap, and uh, hopefully that will assist you in this uh, this sort of new age. Uh, so I'm now going to hand over to Phil Shelton, and uh, please take us away, Phil. There we go. Hi, thanks very much, Chris, and uh, thank you, Marcus. That was really interesting to hear what was going on there as well, um, and what you've been working on. Um, I'm, as Chris just said, I'm going to be here just talking about how we're considering that you can model the carbon emissions of the properties that you're building and retrofitting and how you can take a kind of data approach to doing that in, a, in an automated way that kind of will be easy for people to use day to day in their, in their work. Um, and I apologize in advance because I'm just going to go and set the scene a little bit by stating the obvious um, stuff here in terms of uh, what's going on. Clearly in terms of global warming, um, are getting worse more quickly than we'd anticipated and it's a collective clearly global efforts required to reduce those emissions and to reduce the impact on the environment we know all the housing stock needs to be carbon neutral by 2050 but that's whilst 2050 might seem a long way off there's a lot of work to do quickly to even begin to be able to meet that target um, not least of which because there are lots of more sectors which are going to be much more difficult to decarbonize that need will need time and money and so uh, construction is just one part of that and we're still building homes that will require retrofitting. So new build properties are still going to need more work done to them at this point. Now, that's not something that's going to be an overnight change, clearly. But just to uh, rile Duncan up a little bit, you know, in terms of uh, losing Section 106, maybe that's not a bad thing because we're not buying crap properties from private developers and uh, we get a bit more choice in how we design our properties with SIL. So I'll leave that to him to stew over for a minute. <laughs> um, so. I came across this uh, quote, or I was about this, this uh, email I got from this guy, Andy, um, and he said this, I'm sure I thought it was quite interesting because it touches on what Marcus is saying here about how you educate tenants and bring people on board. And, you know, the crux to delivery here will be the ability to educate, engage and change people's behaviour. Um, and whilst there will be technological solutions here, we have to win hearts and minds of people as well in order to bring... Uh, everyone with us um, and change people's behavior as well as what we're doing in terms of housing. Uh, I, I like the word, the, word the, the use of the word unprecedented because that's all we heard during the initial stages of the pandemic and it feels like actually yeah, this might be a, just an appropriate use of that word here as well. Um, and I don't know if you've seen this, it's, I guess it was shared on LinkedIn, the Financial Times have their own interactive climate game. And in terms of trying to illustrate the scale of the problem that we're all facing, um, they've brought this interactive game on, which is quite a good laugh. You should definitely have a go, or if, uh, or if people are, you think people need to sort of know more about it, let them have a go and see if they can fix the problems themselves through this uh, interactive game. Um, 
I just about managed to scrape through without getting sacked in my role as a climate change uh, guru in this game. But uh, it's really hard. And uh, I think it's quite eye-opening for people as well who want to uh, know a bit more about what's involved in those changes and why, why we need to do this and why it's so important. So viability then. Obviously, at SDS, we focus a lot on uh, cash flow management, on appraisals and so on. And the question arose that, you know, an appraisal, should it just only focus on financial outputs? I mean, I guess the, it's in the name, financial appraisal. So, you know, it makes sense. You have MPV, IRR, payback, cost of value measures. Um, and, you know, that's what, what we all know and love, <laughs> um, so to speak. Yeah, I know, okay, make it a love. But yeah, that's what we know. That's what we do. And we understand why we do it because, you know, that's um, an important part for the process of building. So, how do you measure the environmental impact, environmental impact of uh, over the long term of what you're building and the, even should you in the appraisal is it the right place to do it it's probably not going to surprise you given where i work but yes the answer obviously is yes you should again the nature of my presentation um is really important to assess the long-term carbon footprint of the properties whether you're new built or whether you're retrofitting existing properties you need to understand whether you are adding to the problem or solving it in terms of climate change. And that's exactly the same thing as we're doing with the financial measures. When you look at MPV, for example, you're looking at say, does this scheme add to or detract from my business plan? Therefore, quantitatively, oh, so, yeah, quantitatively, should I be doing this scheme or not? I need some objective data to say, this is, a, this is my model of what's gonna happen in the future with my money. Is it a good invest, this investment decision or is it not? So in the same way with carbon, we need to be able to make those decisions as well. Is this property I'm building going to increase global warming in the future and cause more problems, or is it going to help reduce the problem? How do I even begin to measure that? So in discussing this ASDS, um, the we needed a way of saying, well, okay, how do you take a way of sort of making an archetype and me measuring these uh, sort of this data and measuring how these things work? And as you'll be well aware, you know, EPC data is available. And there's a lot of it and it's publicly available and the, we've employed a data scientist here to, who's been trawling through this to find the relationships between the data and find a way of building a statistical model that would help us utilize and use this data in a way that's not just kind of regurgitating what's already there and the key principle here is that obviously every single time a property is sold it has an epc on the apc we're measuring clearly the ratings and the energy performance but every time that property is sold subsequently there is a new EPC that is carried out on the same property. Okay. And so of the size of the data set we're talking about, this happens frequently across a large number of properties that we have multiple EPCs from the same property. So if between sales, a property has moved from a rating of X to Y, then importantly, as well as knowing that that rating has changed, the EPC step also records the, the modifications that have been made that have led to that improvement. So we know what people are doing to their properties and we know what impact that has on the energy rating as well. So if we can know that, then we can start to actually look at um, components, a statistical model that tells us which components have what kind of impact on CO2 emissions and the EPC rating. And so we build that data into the model, and then that means that when you tell us we're building this type of property, these types of attributes, it means that not only are you now getting in your appraisal results immediately getting in PV, IRR, and anything else you wish, you can also now immediately see the CO2 emissions of that property over the next 100 years. So you have that uh, ability to help you understand what effect it's having to spend the money on these things. So in terms of how that helps you, it means that not only are you now optimizing your unit mix and appraisal to do with financial impact, but you can immediately see the impact environmentally as well. And that enables you to choose properties which are going to have a better long-term effect on the environment and the building and the quality of them. And you can measure that exactly against the cost of building those. So naturally, often um, building a more environmentally friendly property that doesn't um, with all of the things we just, Mark has just mentioned in terms of fabric and design and all those things, and they all cost money. And up till now, it's not been easy to say, well, okay, this scheme has got a really bad financial output, but the reason is because we're doing all these very good things that have this very positive impact. 
And so now you will be able to have those decisions and say, well, look, when you're talking to people who are involved in funding or making decisions on this, it's like, yes, we are going to lose a bit of money on this one over the long term, but it's going to have these other improvements and these other benefits to us as well in the wider environment. Or we're not going to spend as much on this one, but we recognise that actually maybe in 10 years' time, we will be going back and spending money on this property again to bring it back into a standard that's being designed. So on that basis, then, we hope this will, new approach will help people sort of balance those, those two demands which are equally important but give it to you in a way which is kind of easy to use and consume and uh, gives you some useful outputs from it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Phil. Uh, wow I mean that, that was great. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up to uh, I'm going to go to Duncan for some initial comments because Duncan we have spoken about this before in terms of uh, you know, carbon modeling is, is this, and, and one of the things you said to me was, well, if RICs won't give us a higher value, if RICs won't give us a higher rent, then how is it, how is it in any way going to change our appraisals? So well, what's your view on that now? I love it when Phil rips off the top of the can of worms and then puts it in front <laughs> of me to, to, to eat it, Chris, but I'm going to start, I'm going to start with this. I have never met a homeless person who says, I'm not going to live in a drafty house, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of links between what Phil said and what Marcus has said, um, because I admire 100% Wales and West is Wales and West's approach to being customer focused and customer centric and getting the right things in the right areas built to the right quality. Absolutely admire that. The corollary to that is we all know, certainly in England, and I, I, I don't have the stats for Wales, but the target for house building in England is 300,000. And we're getting still absolutely categorically nowhere near that. Um, and that drives two things. One, um, price increase and two, an incredible amount of people on housing waiting lists who still can't get allocated a property to live in. Um, and the reason why we talked about this exact topic, the balancing act, is how does a business like mine balance between, and I do have targets, Marcus, if you have a look, there's numbers on that back of mine. Yeah? <laughs> yeah? Uh, and mine are 550 new homes every year. Um, and I want to build them to the best quality standards I can afford to do so in the places where they need to be um, and for the benefit of those residents. So my driver is build as many as we can to the best standard we can afford as quickly as we possibly can. And section 106 is a really good way for us to do that. Um, and I think the problem, Phil, that you've identified is actually between short term and long termism. So, um, you know, if we were held to the same standards, that's the private development industry and affordable housing, to the same standards, that would be fantastic. But we're not, right? So we, as long-term investors, want to put money into a property now to stop us from reinvesting in 10 years. And the private development industry, and I don't blame them for it, don't give a monkeys about that, right? And that drives as you've mentioned, poor quality around Section 106. It's not poor, right? It's, let's be really clear. It's just built to the standards that they have to build it to. So mm -hmm. my problem with 106 is, is absolutely zero. Just put the regulation in place to make Mr. Barrett or Mr. Taylor MP or whatever volume developer build to the quality and standard that we need. That's it's not 106's fault. It's it's the it's the building regulation standards. Thank you, thank you, Duncan. Um, anything to add to that, Andrew? Uh, yeah, you know, EPC or or SAP, Phil. So you know, everyone does a SAP uh, assessment. You know, SAP is probably you know more uh, defined of what energy efficiencies you're putting into a property. Uh, that drives out the EPC result, you know. So, yeah, a SAP, a SAP assessment is, is probably more detailed and then helps that. But as you say, regulation of, of build is the most important part to force people. And, and we, we've, we've argued this for, for forever in the sector. Uh, uh, it's got to be a, a, a um, 
level playing field between the private and, and, and uh, the affordable social sector of building. And that, that's, that's got to happen. Um, the also part is, 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 is the consumer. And, and it's the consumer is, is demanding more. And I'm sure with the cost of energy soaring um, and continues going to do that, the consumer will be leading the fight of the private developer starting to do more energy efficiency of their properties, maybe. Maybe it's the consumer-led um, approach. Well, I don't know whether you want to come back in, but I didn't answer Chris's question and, um, and that, that, uh, about the valuation aspect. You go first and I'll talk about valuation. No, well, no, well okay. Um, all I was going to say was the this we're in... Um, and it, We've rapidly found ourselves in a, in a situation globally where uh, things are getting worse. We recognise suddenly there's got to be fairly dramatic change very quickly. This has all happened very quickly. So no one has been sitting here going for the last 10, 20 years going, oh, well, you know, we should really be doing it to the standard, but screw it, we won't bother. Well, maybe they have, but not in this, with the same level of awareness perhaps they have now. And so you're right, there is, we do need to build more properties. We have a massive shortfall, agreed. Private developers are only interested in trading the value of the land. So what if, just whatever sells the land at the best price is what they're going to build and they won't do anything more or less than that. That's always been the case. So section one of SIPs is right, you're right. It definitely helps increase the supply by forcing them to sell the properties on. And with SIL, the difficulty is also that we're going to have um, money being tied up and not coming out necessarily where it needs to go as quickly as we would like. And so we'll see a dip as that kind of mechanism has to ramp up quickly. So, but it will get there clearly. If people, that's the way it has to happen, it will start to work eventually. In terms of modelling the environmental impact of the properties and whether you should be saying I need to focus on delivering the house right now that's not going to be carbon efficient but is going to meet an immediate demanding need. It's at this point we don't have a quick way of saying what is that decision we're making. We're making it blindly and so by saying look we've got you have all sorts of different ways of measuring for energy performance of a property. What we do have right now what we the best thing we have right now is this huge data set of EPC stuff that lets us at least make a prediction of the quality of that property and its long-term impact. Now, like anything in an appraisal, it's a prediction. It's not real life. Other things will factor in. There's already seen there's been a question about embedded carbon, which Chris is probably going to come back to in a minute. You know, there are other factors which will play on that. But it is about trying to find a consistent method of making an informed decision so that you can say, okay, yeah, this prioritizes this, or generally this longer-term prioritizes the short-term in this case, as Mark is doing. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. I, I, I agree, mate. And 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 the functionality to do that, and how we gather that data and can refine that data to make it more and more and more useful. I'll wave yeah. the flag and say, sign me up. Right? No, no issue with with, with that whatsoever. But let's just uh, uh, forgive me for answering Chris's question around valuation, and it, it might be a slightly um, uh, again contentious point because that's all I do is make contentious points, really, isn't it? And um, uh, I, I. I I kind of get the sense that we need to get the marketplace buying properties that give better carbon outputs, as Andrew said, um, and therefore there's a valuation support that we need to identify. The properties that have closer to net zero carbon are more valuable than ones that don't. Um, and again, that might be a target, I'm sorry, wrong word, um, a goal, Marcus, I think is what the, the, uh, we used earlier, to try and influence um, the RICS and its members to get to a position of starting to absorb some of the data that's generated by, um, uh, by your new WYSI thing, Phil, uh, to, to enable them to attribute a higher value. Because the more we can do that, certainly in the affordable housing sector, obviously the debt um, circle higher value properties, more we can borrow, more we can invest, and on, on we go in, in terms of our business plan. So that's the answer to the question, Chris, before I get told off for not answering it. Okay, thank um, you. Uh, and I suppose then the, 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 the second part to, you know, is there another way? There's always another way, right? Absolutely, 100% fully in support of is there another way? But we have been there before, right? So... I'm long enough in the tooth now, hear the chorus of no, you don't look old enough, to remember all of the cycles that we've been through about how we're going to do this differently. New cycle of local authority building, well, I must have been through four of them. Um, new cycle of 
Um, we're we've got we're going to get new skills into the industry. We're going to get a lot of people excited about working in affordable housing. That's that's not happened. So uh, all I'm saying is, if we get to a position where we're giving local authorities big pots of money um, to go and deliver their affordable housing outcomes, they don't deliver their any of their planning targets presently. I appreciate that's a, a very blanket statement. Some do, some do not. But then go and ask them to deliver all of the affordable housing that's needed in that local authority area with a big pot of money. Frankly, no disrespect to local authority colleagues, they can't do it and they can't do it quick enough. So it, it, it's a skills issue as well. It's a land availability issue. It's a commercials issue. It's a uh, a contracting issue, it's a procurement issue. The list is palpably endless. You are not giving the right people the resources to deliver the outcomes, in my opinion, Michael Gove. If he wants to give me a ring, a, a ring and have a chat about it, I'll, I'll happily say, you know, the world is calling to Duncan Smith. Um, I think you have, we, should, we should have a, a chat with Lisa Nandy, who wants his job, and she could probably do with all of that ammunition. Uh, so, uh, uh, sorry for the slight interruption there. Um, this is my cat, Knoxville. He's made a few sort of appearances. Uh, he's 20. I've had him since I was at uni, and I could hear him scratching on the door, and I didn't want him to be in distress. Uh, we're going to go to a, a question here. Uh, Sarah Cole. Uh, Sarah, uh, I'm now allowing you to talk. Uh, please, can you, uh, you, you've typed in a few, we would really love to hear uh, your, your questions and engage the panel, please, all to you, Sarah. Well, I, I, I would like to get my money's worth or not, a free one, but um, of any uh, webinar that I do attend. So yes, I'm yet quite, I'm yet quite um, adding lots of questions in. So um, <clears throat> TAF, uh, like Wells and West, we're, we're very small, we're small compared to Wales and West, we're based in the centre of Cardiff and we are trying to build all of our new homes to EPCA standard from a, um, a fabric first approach. And, um, and we've got quite um, a demanding government in Wales. It's really trying to push ahead on the agenda as it's put in there. They're looking at EPCA, they're out for consultation shortly. The minister no, um, made a co comment yet last couple of days um, on the, w, the WHQS, um, the Welsh Housing Quality Standard 20. Uh, 33 whether she wants APCA for all of our stock by uh, 2033 which um, never lenders are getting nervous about because um, you know are we going to have uh, issues and we have the we have some very old very poor quality stock that we are thinking about well is this actually beneficial in terms of uh, return for us and our tenants and um, so it, you know, we can end up with really perverse um, um, consequences. So to that, is EPCA the right? Uh, we believe in a fabric first um, targeting what our tenants requirements are in their homes is a better approach than necessarily EPCA as a, as a blanket standard. It's sort of EPCA with context, as it were. Um, we think that's a better method. And then there's the conversations about uh, at where, what point does it become the balance between that um, improvement and what you're losing in terms of um, throwing away materials or not being able to recycle materials effectively, does it become illogical to do this? It's, uh, there's lots of unintended conversations. We think it's absolutely the right thing to be pushing on with our new home development to the best standard we possibly can to avoid retrofit in future. We don't have an awful lot of section 106, we'd love to do more. Um, but obviously, we there is also conversation with our minister about trying to get um, those domestic house builders to raise their standards as well, uh, which uh, they uh, they threaten to walk out of Wales on a regular basis, and they don't seem to go anywhere. They're still they're still building, but um, it's it's really interesting the comparisons between Wales and England. But yeah, I think there's a lot about EPCA is it the right thing and what we can do to avoid. Uh, unhelpful conversations as we move forward. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, and any reaction to that from the panel? Yeah, I, I'm happy to go first, as I always am, Chris. Um, house builders will never work out of anywhere, walk out of anywhere where there's money to be made. Let's be really clear about that, Sarah. So, uh, and, and I'll never build anything to any higher standard than the standard that they are actually regulated to do so. So let's um, let's take those two things as read. I, I admire the Welsh government and um, 
wanting to to set really stringent challenges uh, the, the standards i really do admire them um but i suggest it's done without understanding what that means for your organization and what that means for others like marcus's and anybody who works in wales um who holds stock for a long period of time so um all fully in support of the agenda good luck with delivering it <laughs> <laughs> We invite, we invite Sarah back. We invite Sarah back in a, yeah. in a, in a, in a next year. And if you find yeah, a solution, not. Sarah, please do tell us. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm the same boat as Marcus. You know, um, we're we're really fortunate in Wales that we have quite a collaborative sector, and we, you know, we we swap yeah. ideas. We, we've been having a fantastic program called in, uh, called the Optimized Retrofit Program, which um, has really done. Uh, I know Marcus's team have done some work with them. Um, we have as well um trying to think of ways the issue we've had is finding methods that we can scale up easily that is it's been really tricky hasn't it marcus yeah i, I can admit I just yeah definitely and i think a, a lot of the retrofit stuff has has been driven incorrectly up until now uh, maybe we're looking at solutions to improve kind of heating systems and energy rather than looking at the fabric of the building um, and I think that's been the biggest challenge is it needs to be more investment into the fabric before you can look at some of the heating solutions and, those, and, and adding on PV and those kind of things. So I think that, that that's been a big challenge. I think one thing that Sarah said earlier about an, another option to EPCA, we've started looking at um, kind of operational energy targets and setting a kind of a, a kilowatt meter squared per year kind of target. And, and that's what we're kind of looking at as an organization now, because that means something to the resident. We know how much you know it's about the energy consumption in the building, uh, in their home over over a year over a year period, rather than an EPCA figure which you can just add on bolt on bolt on bolt on and it, it, it gets you that EPCA um, certificate which doesn't really mean anything. So yeah, I, I'm I'm with you there. Um, lots of challenges and at least you know it, it, Welsh government are up for the debate. Um, you know, with, with with the approval process we talked about in terms of that kind of concept of pre-planning approval, we can have that debate with Welsh Government saying, well, actually, we're not going to meet EPCA here because we believe this approach is better. And that is something, to be fair, they have accepted on certain schemes. They said it's not, it doesn't set a precedent. But if we can demonstrate that we've got better mechanisms to, to deliver and reach better targets, they are open to, 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 to having those conversations as well, which is good. Yes. To me, seems like uh, as well a, a capital versus revenue funding problem for the government, really. Again, isn't it? It's like when they reduce, when they said, "Oh, we're giving out too much capital grant." You know, it's about ten years ago, wasn't it? And they said we're going to switch from that and we're going to hike rents up, so you don't need as much grant, and they're just going to claim more housing benefit. And that worked well until the housing benefit bill went up too high, and then they had to correct the other way. And they've got exactly the same choice now. The solution to the problem is they need to chuck a lot of money at it because this is a big, expensive problem and it's only it needs to be fixed. So they either give you the money up front and they fund these things to be done and give you the support, or they recognise it's going to be the other way around and they're going to be funding instead tenants and other uh, people to actually pay the, the increasingly expensive bills they're going to have to run, run their homes. And that's a crap solution anyway, clearly, because it doesn't solve the problem of the retrofitting anyway in the first place or doesn't give the same scope so um yeah simplistically yeah we just need lots more money that's that's the yeah, but for, for, <laughs> that's, that's exact point is it for your business plan right yeah. um you know, you know forgive my welsh colleagues i'm going to be a bit disparaging here but doing social rent and you have been doing social rent with a nice slugger glance happy happy days your business plans lovely jubbly ours has been asked to be sweated by disposing of some assets and reinvesting the money in new affordable housing, delivering affordable rent, which I appreciate is not a hugely high risk profile, but it's a higher risk profile than delivering social rent. And now delivering all the improvements to our existing stock, which is the right thing to do, 100%, but for the benefit of the running costs of our customers, not our business plan. So retrofitting our existing stock while the right thing to do, hand on heart, going to do it all, absolutely fine. But for our business plan, prejudices our investment in new build homes. And then that brings in the juxtaposition with the quality of those new build homes. We want to build the best quality we possibly can now, but we also want to build the most number. So you can't do those two things together and retrofit our existing, in our case, 22,000 properties and get them up to that higher level and deliver all those things at the same time. So something has to give in that. Our choice um, at the moment, um, is delivering the numbers because those numbers reinvest income back into our business plan, which help 
delivering the retrofit. And that's not, I'm not, not saying it's right, wrong or indifferent. It's just our choice presently. We'll move towards those higher standards as quickly as we can possibly afford to do so. But the, the, the difficulty is you're making those choices every single day. And with cost increases as they are in the marketplace, and I don't know how, how you're seeing that, Marcus, you can, you can tell me in a moment, no doubt. But at the moment, I can't afford to do higher standards, meet my programme and set grant requirements, which aren't like they work in Wales, so we, we set our strategic partnership grant requirements in 2017 um, and, and now we're, our, our cost base is nothing to do with 2017 and that's still fixed. So we're funding the difference. So those are the things that we're grappling with, which no disrespect to you, of course, um, you wouldn't be necessarily grappling with in Wales. Brilliant. Thank you, Duncan. Um, Sarah, I'm going to ask you to stay on the call. I, I'd really like if you if you stayed in the conversation. Is that OK? Yeah, that's fine. Brilliant. Always got okay. a lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> it's modelling, though, Duncan, isn't it? Is it modelling? You know, modelling that 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 cost base increase. So, so obviously, Sorry. my role my role in TAF is is the um, executive director of business and finance. So we have thirty year plans um, that we're putting together now, and to date, most of our thirty year plans have only included the retrofit as a stress test. Um, <clears throat> this year. In TAF, I've chosen to um, put um, a retrofit programme in there. Nothing to do with the Welsh Government programme, though. It's 2045 that I'm looking to complete it by. And it's uh, I'm basically, I've balanced it off, Duncan, um, and I appreciate this is, even in Wales, this is unlikely to happen, um, to moderate the impact of my business plan by uh, supplementing with grant. I, that's not going to happen, but I just wanted to show the scale uh, of what was going to be required um, because um, like you all, I have to go out and get funding. So I needed to put something to calm my lenders down a little bit. <laughs> so, um, you know, we, we've, we've just got um, some more money off uh, B Lend. And so we got the A3 Moody's and, and it, I will need to maintain that. Yeah. Um, and and it, it, it is really hard. And I agree with you, Duncan. Um, there's a lot of pressure on development numbers, but for me, it's just a perverse, um, outcome to say that we wouldn't be building more of those really high quality new homes that we desperately need in order um, to massively retrofit homes that most of our tenants are happy living in and, and can afford. It just seems a perverse consequence. So why we will look to retrofit where we can, I, I'm, you know, I've got a lot of pepper potted properties in um, old streets in Cardiff it's not going to make any sense to do very much there um so so yeah yeah very much aware of the wrap them in bubble wrap sarah yeah <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it's um it's a case of you know being packed even with the more uh, benign uh, financial um situation here in wales then can we do have our own challenges I'm and uh, and and uh, but yes we're very very grateful for the living this side of the board <laughs> I'm coming back, Sarah. I'm moving back to Wales. I'm coming to uh, tomorrow. Okay, um, Andrew, can, let's just go into what you back to what you were saying. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just it, it's back to modelling, isn't it? You know, a, a modelling modelling your kind of uh, your scheme, your units that actually reach some kind of SAP or EPC rating, and you know that model, and you know the cost, and you know what that that model looks like. To say we can't do it at forty five years, it has to be sixty. You know, and that's that's the that's what is probably required more is is the argument about what impact these individual units. I'm talking about new build, not you know retrofitting. That's that's a whole new uh, ball game of 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 complexity. Um, but start with a new build and model it, and then push the product, the units, and what it can do for you, and then replicate that. That's what the private sector do well, may not be to the standard that we currently want or need. Uh, yeah, yes, and um, but again, let's, let's let's just touch on MMC for a second. So this white knight coming over the hill, MMC at scale, higher standards. Well, you know, it's 20% more expensive than traditional anyway. Mm. And now pushing that standard on again, in this marketplace, sorry, I just can't afford to build it. No. And we've got to lend on it. Well, I'm not do outright sale. 
I, I, you, 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 can. you can, as long as it's an approved product, Chris. Um, you can. You, you there's, can. There's, there's been movement from uh, Rick on, on helping us through that. But they'll only accept it for us as a as a as a chargeable at probably twenty five percent of our overall portfolio. But it'll take a long time to get to twenty five percent. So let's leave that there. It's just the cost of doing it. Mm, yeah. You know, I, I can't give volume when it's thirty five percent more expensive than traditional build. I can't no. buy the land upon which to build it if it's thirty five percent more expensive. No. So the standard, the stuff that gives us the better carbon outcomes now. It's thirty five percent more expensive than the stuff that doesn't, so it's it's just not a thing. That's that's going to be interesting when again, Duncan. I think it's the appreciation of the scale. So uh, again, working in Cardiff, we at TAF we do uh, niche and small and difficult. So actually, some of our sites MNC MNC may actually balance out even with the additional costs because of the ease of working with it and having to close highways and uh, the costs of uh, other associated costs then we're looking to see whether we can actually balance out some of those additional costs um, in working some of our tight sites. Um, I would yeah. humbly suggest, Sarah, that's a, a lovely thing. Um, uh, <laughs> we're, doing but... it, we're doing it very small and niche at the moment. But, you know, again, as Marcus says, we, we'll be looking to learn lessons from it and see what we can achieve and share that with the rest of the sector. Um, and, um, and, Again, it's one of those things, isn't it? Um, at what point does there become enough demand to bring the market, to bring the price to be more more um, usable uh, across a larger scale? I can see a move from government to go back to a grant rate based on the, what you have in the property, like we used to have with TCIs and stuff. Um, because, as you say, the only way to make MMC affordable is to have volume. The only way to have volume is to bring the price down. And if you can't afford to do that yet, it's got to be something to help it get to that stage if that's the way it's going to go so to so be able to say to the government right we're going to use this option but that means that we get more grant for it because it's that much more expensive um, but, that, but that, that's part of the new H ahp program phil so minimum 25 percent requirement for mmc and um they add a lot of ticks yeah. in a lot of boxes uh in terms of the grant rates to deliver that and they are also via homes england investing one of the biggest mmc house builders in the country um, which, from my look at their um, uh, accounts, they're insolvent. But anyway, let's not talk about that right now. Uh, so it, it's kind of like I, I, I'm, I'm fully in support of the endeavour, right? Mm. But it, government have to make that change, and it has to be fair across the whole. So you can't put all of your eggs in a particular basket around that, because who knows whether that basket is going to continue to be a basket that doesn't have holes in the bottom of it. And um, so, you know, it's it, the whole way of doing MMC has to change, or the funding of it, uh, I think, has to change. It's a cheerful to keep you going, isn't it, Duncan? <laughs> oh, honestly. <laughs> It is, the, it is the worst or the most difficult yeah. conditions, I think, in the whole of my career. I mean, I mean, yeah. I genuinely have been doing no, no, this for I've, 20 I've, years now. It's, it's tough, woman. man. <laughs> yeah. no, I, I agree no, with you, Duncan. I've been in social housing since 2000 and I came in from semiconductors. And I remember thinking, my goodness, this sect, this is easy, easy life here. Um, you know, coming from uh, working with ch uh, chips. And um, it was... Um, it was, you know, housing associations were sitting on pots of money, not really making me, me, good minimal use of their, all their funds. And, and it, it's just like each, you know, every sort of four years, we've got like another thing that chips away at it, chips away at it, chips away at it. So it's, uh, it is getting, we're certainly earning our money now. <laughs> I thought when you talked about chips, yeah. Sarah, you were talking about Caroline Street, Boulevard de oh, Street. Wow. Oh, no. I can't wait to come back to that. <laughs> Yes, Chippy Alley, otherwise known as fabulous. Um, any any further questions from our audience? Um, I mean, we're, we're getting up to eleven o'clock <clears> now. It feels like it's been a, a really lively debate, and we've been we've been going for thirty minutes now. So it, it, it's been a really great session. But I, I wonder if there's if there's any stone we left unturned here that, that possibly we could finish on. I, I think it's just um, how we get all of our ducks in a row to have those conversations with the ministers or with their advisors or and what have you trying to say this is a massive issue um, that we need to work together on 
to resolve and and getting those clear messages you know is epca the right thing is mmc the right thing it's a mix uh, it, it, it's it's there's no one size fits all solution so it's how we get that understanding and what it is they really want to achieve and obviously that's quite difficult with this government currently because it does tend to vary <laughs> yeah thank you sarah um phil any closing comments no um yeah it's a can be challenging times ahead as always but you know on the plus side to have a slight note of optimism rising to the two difficult challenges is something the uh social housing sector has always done very well so i have faith in everyone we're going to make it through and get this get this right stop trying to be inspirational <laughs> come on <laughs> we can do it <laughs> we're going to put that on linkedin um duncan closing comments yeah no look i i know i am the angel of doom in this regard but um yeah, look, I, I, we've still got a positive outlook. There's lots to do. Um, we've just got to find a way through it. Um, and hopefully we can get to a position where um, we can train the people of tomorrow to be able to deliver it and I can go and retire and be less grumpy. <laughs> yeah, Thank yeah. you, Marcus. Blaney, any closing comments? I was say, no, it's, it's, it's a challenge, but everyone likes a challenge. You know, it's, it's makes, it makes days easier and more interesting and um, why we enjoy working in this sector, I suppose. So if it was easy, then... Um, What's the point? So, <laughs> thank you very much, Marcus. Andrew, closing comments, please. Uh, a bit of lively debate. Debate has been really good, actually. I think uh, we should take those comments back and try and get some ministers on that. Be interesting. We uh, uh, and regulators and and dive into this kind of where this um, section one hundred six and and the local authorities um, going to pick that up. That we might be very interesting uh, to. Uh, conclude yeah so look out watch this space i'm working on a webinar uh hopefully for next month and i'm just waiting on confirmation uh but uh, yeah, it, it's going to be an interesting one we're going to continue this debate uh so i'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and taking the time if you'd like to get in touch and send us some feedback on where you feel this debate should go and what we should feature on our next webinar then please do uh do that i i, I would love to hear from you uh so everyone have a really great week the sun is shining and uh yeah it's been really great today thank you Thank you. Thank you for letting me join in. Oh, it was a pleasure, Sarah. And I will be in touch in the future. We'd love you to be a regular panelist. <laughs> okay, cheers. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Bye now. Bye. -bye. Bye.